this time it's my honor to introduce Dr. Scott Reed. Scott Reed is a Vice Provost of University Outreach and Engagement, as well as the Director of Oregon State University Extension Service. But more important, Scott is a member of the Gamma Chapter of Epsilon Sigma Phi, and we truly appreciate having Scott as a member of the Gamma Chapter. So please give a warm welcome to Scott, who will be introducing our this morning's speaker. our uh, main speaker this morning, Dr. Larry Roper. Uh, Larry is a professor in the School of Language, Culture, and Society at Oregon State University and coordinator of the Undergraduate Social Justice Program uh, at the university. Previously, he served as a vice provost for student affairs uh, from 1993 to 2014, which should illustrate his staying power in a field where university administrators average about five years or so in place. Uh, for some of that 20 years, I had the the joy of working alongside of him um, on the university's leadership team. He also served uh, for about 18 months as the interim dean uh, of the College of Liberal Arts. Larry has degrees from Heidelberg University, Bowling Green State University, and the University of Maryland. He's had a number of uh, positions in student affairs, including director of housing, associate dean for students, coordinator of multicultural affairs, and of course, vice president for student affairs and, and dean of students. Larry currently serves as a commissioner on the state uh, board, or the Oregon State Higher Education Coordinating Commission. He's on the board of trustees for Heidelberg. He's president of the Jackson Street Youth Shelter in Corvallis, uh, a unit that serves um, homeless and vulnerable youth, and on the education committee of the Oregon Community Foundation. He served a four-year term as editor of the NSPA Journal, which is an organization of student affairs administrators and six years as commissioner with the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. Larry has um, published more than 50 items in the form of book chapters, journal articles, magazine articles, book reviews, and monographs. He writes a regular column for the Journal of Colleges and Character. He's co-editor of the book Teaching for Change, uh, The Difference, uh, Power, and Discrimination Model. Um, and he's editor of Supporting and Supervising Mid-Level Professionals, Creating a Path to Success. He has served on more than 65 theses or dissertation committees, some of which I have shared with him, um, and has chaired more than 25. Um, now, going off script, um, I've known Larry and worked with him for more than a decade. He hears the whispers in an organization. A careful listener, Larry translates relationships with issues into leadership opportunities. He's a champion for the unheard and the invisible while developing leadership qualities and all. But many times as I've heard Larry interact with him, I can't wait uh, what he will include in his address to us today. Leadership and you, a priceless combination. Larry? So I want to be respectful of your time, but at the same time, really want to um, 
hopefully share something with you that, that's of value. So I want to um, start with just sort of share a little bit about my hopes for today. You know, as, a, as leaders, we're in the middle of it all the time. And sometimes it's really hard to have the opportunity to, to step back, to retreat, um, to a sense of time thinking about sort of who am I and where am I. And so I would hopefully that we can use this time this morning as a time for you to um, engage in some contemplation and reflection. A chance to just think about where you are and who you are and, and in some ways how it feels to be you. Um, an opportunity for maybe to get some nourishment and not necessarily um, the nourishment from, from, my, from my comments um, but the nourishment that comes from being able to tell yourself the gift that you are and to get back in touch with your, your spirit um, and to, to, to feel like you have the ability um, to sustain yourself and to realize that there's, there's a source there that allows you to be able to do that. And then finally an opportunity to care for the, the inner landscape. You know, we spend so much time having to act in the outer world that we oftentimes don't get the time to spend thinking about so sort of what is the what is the inner landscape of my life look like beyond my actions and beyond the behaviors um, in which I in which I engage. Um, and so this, hopefully this is a time to, to be able to do that and, 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 to, and to relax in some ways. So I want to start with just some of the assumptions that I have because I think again um, my history shows up, um, my beliefs show up um, when I show up, and I have some pretty strong beliefs right now about, about leadership and what it means to be a leader. Um, and so I want to start, I really believe deeply that our organizations have a strong desire for leadership, innovation, and community. They not only desire it, but they need it. Our communities are in need of leadership. I and mean, we can look at our organization, but we can look at society broadly. And I think there is a, there's, a, there's a deep desire for people to be in community with each other and for people to experience leadership. And hopefully, um, as I go through it, you'll get a sense of what I mean by, by leadership. Um, but at the same time, leadership, the kind of leadership that's needed, that, that sort of innovative leadership, really requires that we enter the world of the unknown. So when I think about, oftentimes, when I think about the world that, that I envision, or, or even look at our organization's mission, in many ways, what I hear it described is a world in which I've never been. We're, we're, we're trying to lead people toward the unknown. We're leading toward a world that's not yet appeared, but we sort of have this faith, this belief, that the unknown and the unseen is possible. And so it requires somehow that we, that we enter and we embrace that world of the, of the unknown. Um, but also that transforming ourselves is integral to transforming our, our institutions or transforming our world. I can't stay the same and have the world around me change. And transformation is, can be painful. I mean, I share people with people oftentimes my own undergraduate experience where I um, moved from Akron, Ohio to, to Tiffin, Ohio. I don't know if anybody from Ohio is here, but it's moving from this industrial city to this small rural town. And I lasted three days. <laughs> you know, and three days I hitchhiked back home. Um, thinking I was going to stay there, but I was raised by a black woman. <laughs> and, um, and, I learned that my word, my, my perspective didn't really matter. <laughs> and uh, so I found my way back. <laughs> um, but then realized that, you know, I had to transform myself in order to, to live in a world that wasn't the world that I knew. Um, and to create the future that I wanted, I had to transform myself. Um, and finally, I think that people are looking for connection, engagement, and nourishment. I think there is a deep yearning within our organizations for connection and relationship. And I think that's a role that leaders play. 
And so, when I think about leadership, I think about leadership as sort of this journey uh, of self-authorship. <coughs> that we are in the process of writing our own story and writing our organization's story. Um, and that, and that self-authorship, that, that journey, requires um, that we be prepared for both the struggle and the joy that comes with leadership, that comes with being in that kind of deep, intimate relationship with others, that uncovering, helping others to uncover the best possibilities for the future um, involves. And what makes a journey successful and effective. I just finished a journey I was sharing with Scott but driving my 18 year old from, from Oregon to California. We took 10 days um, to drive along the Oregon and California coast as I dropped them. And um, what I can tell you is what makes for a good journey, journey is having good company and being good company. And as leaders, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is my ability to be a good company? And what does good company for me look like? And can I construct that network that provides me with the company that I need to have the successful journey that I'd like to have um, as a leader? So about the leadership journey, I want to share a little bit about what I think are some of the important components, some of the things that, that matter on a, on a successful leadership journey. First of all, I think we need to think about leadership, about what does it mean for us to be positive leaders. Um, again, we can think about leaders that can lead in many directions. There can be positive leadership, there can be negative leadership. There's hardly ever any such thing as neutral leadership, but leadership is dynamic. <laughs> You're going one way or the other. Um, and when you think about leadership, leadership has the ability, positive leadership has the ability to heal, to repair, and to restore. Now, we have no control over the condition of the lives that come to us in our organization. But we do have control over how we greet those lives. You know, I recall I had a, a, a young man who I supervised. Um, and when I would do my one-on-one -on -one meetings, it was, it was pretty unstructured. Um, structure is really my thing. Um, but, and I, my question, I would just start with one question, how's it going? And literally for the, the first year that the person was employed, the response was always the same. It was fine, I think. Why? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so finally after a year, it, we, I just said, okay, I said, you need to stop. I said, let me play back to you the dance that we've been in for the last year. So, so that every time I would ask you, how's it going? Your response is always the same. Fine, I think. Why, what have you heard? I said, tell me about your last supervisor. He said, well, you know, I would always go into meetings thinking that everything was okay. And then she would spring something on me. I said, and you're waiting for that supervisor to show up here. I said, that person's not gonna show up. So when I ask, how's it going, I really like to hear the story of what's going on with you and where I can, where I can be helpful. And so we don't know the kind of injury, the kind of history, the kind of hurt, the kind of pain, the discouragement that people may be feeling. And it may be our leadership that becomes the healing agent, the healing element in the lives of those in our organization. And so as, as positive leaders, we have this ability to create a sense of belonging for people, to create space. Um, a, an environment that really acknowledges the interdependence that we have. That we're not just solitary, isolated individuals. We're a network. We're connected in our organizations. And that, and that connection matters. And that connection can be, can be powerful. Um, but good positive leadership also elevates the accountability. This idea that we all share responsibility for the condition of the space that we share with each other. That it's not just the leader's responsibility to make the organization a good organization. That is a shared responsibility and that is a, that is a shared journey. It demonstrates for us the, that each person, the, the value and the importance of each person. And it is a remarkable 
the number of people who you can talk to in the organization who wonder whether or not they're valued. And as our organizations go through a difficult times, we know the ups and downs that come with budgets and resource chase shifts and everything. The first thing that starts to get questioned is individual value. Do I matter? Am I going to be okay when the dust when the dust settles? And so positive leadership, even when we make changes, we can elevate the value of others. You know, and you know, Scott and Debbie and other people can share with you. The horrors that we've had in terms of the budget issues we've had to deal with over the last 20 years in the state of Oregon. And in our organization, we, we finally developed some very clear principles. And the simplest one was that people matter, structure doesn't. And whatever decision we make, there will be decisions that represent growth. So even when other people thought we were cutting, we were realigning to get in closer connection with the achievement of our mission. So for us, the language of leadership has become very important around how do we do this in a way that ensures that people understand that they matter. Um, and so positive leadership then offer, can offer us that guidance in terms of our relationship with our not just re the development of relationships, but the maintenance and the substance of relationships over time. You know, we oftentimes don't talk about it, but when we're successful leaders, we actually deepen people's love, people's sense of affection for our organizations. Meg Wheatley writes about sort of fear and love in organizations, and it's really easy for us to talk about what we fear, but we very seldom talk about affection in our organization. And, and my sense is that it's very difficult to successfully lead people for whom you don't have a sense of affection. That you have to feel deeply for people to make the best decisions on their behalf and to truly honor the lives that they bring, they bring to you. And so, in my view, positive leadership really does inspire commitment um, and contribution. When we lead, we become meaning makers and place makers. We make meaning of our relationships within the organization, so we become something more than just sort of a chance gathering of individuals. We now have this, we have now have a sense of power, strength, and substance in our relationships. And oftentimes, again, that's around the mission and the work that we have, the service to which, the service to which we're called as an organization. Um, we can bring order to chaos. Um, and I have a high tolerance for chaos, um, realizing that there are a lot of people who don't. Um, but I have a high tolerance for chaos. But just having a tolerance, so I can have a tolerance for chaos, but still be seeking order. It's a disservice to people to just leave them in chaos. And so we can say, yeah, we're going to have chaos for a while, but there is an order waiting to be claimed. And our responsibility to you as leaders is to lead people toward that, toward that order. Um, as leaders, we foster um, connections among those who are isolated. We give audibility to the voiceless. We bring visibility to those who are invisible. And we pull those who are on the margins to the center. And so what we, in a sense, do is we enhance mattering. There's this, this notion of marginality and <coughs> am I on the margins or am I at the center? And does it matter that I am there? You know, I just would share with student leaders often that um, people don't join organizations, people join people. And that it's very easy to get somebody to show up the first time. <laughs> But then the second is how we treat them that first time that determines whether or not they think it's worth them coming back the next time. Does it matter that I am there? And the number of people in our organizations who can share the stories of, I met my desk, people come by, they treat me as if I'm invisible, they take things. <laughs> it's almost as if I'm not there. Or I will say something in a meeting and I don't get hurt. 
And so we give people a, a, a sense of voice. Um, and I'm sure others of you have gone through gone through the experience of you know, raising children and, and, and sort of having these things where they say and it sort of strikes you um, in terms of whether or not we give people voice. Um, when my son was much younger, he um, was into SpongeBob. And so we were sitting at breakfast. We were sitting at breakfast one day. And he says, um, so dad, um, I want to tell you about the ingredients in the Krabby Patty. Um, but I'm not good like SpongeBob. So if I hesitate, um, don't steal my paws. And I said, well, what do you mean by steal your paws? He said, well, sometimes I'm at the Montessori. He went to the Montessori school. He said, well, sometimes I'm at the Montessori. I'll be telling a story, and somebody will steal my paws, and I don't get to finish my story. He said, and the bad part is, all of the good stuff comes after the paws. <laughs> you know, and so what happens sometimes when people have are voiceless, they feel as if the pause is always stuck. <laughs> that we think about how our groups function. We don't create a place for everyone at the table. <coughs> you know, so as leaders, if we start with this acknowledgement that the world doesn't look the same to everybody, the world doesn't feel the same to everybody, but as a leader, we can create access to the same organizational opportunities, to the same organizational visibility, the same organizational voice, through our behaviors and through the roles that, that we play. And again, hopefully we'll um, look at that a little, bit, a little bit later. And so one of the ways that I think that we, I would suggest we do that is to ask you as leaders um, to go through an examination of your, of your human landscape. When we get up in the morning, well, maybe not right? You know, you look in the mirror, right? you check yourself out. <laughs> you say, okay, am I good? No, nothing you might do. Because we want to make sure that on our outer landscape that we're okay, we're presentable. Do we do that same examination of our inner landscape? Do we check it out before we leave home in the morning to say, am I right? Am I in the, the right condition? And so when you look at your inner landscape, there's, I would ask you to look at three dimensions of your being. The weight of your being, the breadth of your being, and the depth of your being. And I was just spend just a couple minutes talking about, um, talking about each of those. So when you think about the weight of your being, what is the heaviness or the lightness of your being? So how heavy or how light does it feel to be you? How much emotional or psychic weight are you carrying? So in a sense, what's taking up sort of emotional or psychological space for you? You know, I start all of my classes, I start by giving students that opportunity to say, we want to go around and say, what's taking up emotional or psychological space for you? Because I want to be able to give students permission to say, you know, I can't be fully present because I've got a sick child at home. Or, you know, I just had a conversation with my parents and they had some health issues, or there's something I'm really struggling about my ability to pay for this term. Um, I don't have enough to eat. And so to think about sort of what's, what's it feel like to be you? And how much psychological, emotional weight are you carrying? And what kind of lifting does it require of people to be in relationship with you? I was on a panel with a, with a colleague from the Counseling Center, and he was saying that he worked in a, in a counseling agency once where the supervisor had dots. She had a red dot, a yellow dot, and a green dot. And she would each day post a different color dot outside of the office. So the red dot meant don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the yellow dot was, you know, so enter, but, but do so gently. And the green dot meant it's all good. And um, you know, he was saying, well, you know, as a leader, he didn't want to be one of those three dot people. And you know, sort of being the smart ass that I am, I, I said, well, in the spirit of generosity, at least she was thoughtful enough to put out the dots. How many of us work with people who haven't put out the dots? And you have to go in and you have to ask, what kind of mood is he or she in today? 
And, and what that is, if we're asking, do I have permission to be fully human today in this person's presence? Or do I have to suppress my humanity in order to participate in this organization today? Well, think about what it does to people to, on a daily basis, to have to calibrate the expression of their humanity. I mean, as leaders, <laughs> what we would hope is that we bring a sense of lightness, that every day, everybody can show up with their best self. And if nothing else, we will be the ones who will be tolerant that people sometimes can't show up with their best self. But unfortunately, the leader doesn't get the same latitude as others. Because what happens is that when people think about the leader, they think about them showing up as their worst. They think about them showing up as their most punitive. Right? I don't want to say something wrong. I don't want to cross that person. And so think about what it means to sort of bring lightness to the organization. But to ask yourself on a daily basis, so what does it feel like to be me? I can recall when I first started at Oregon State, I was walking, um, I was walking through the campus, and it was the first week of school, and some some young freshman yeah, who I'm actually still in touch with, so, sort of sideways inside and said, "Hey, how you doing?" And he shook my hand and he said, "Let's go introduce himself." He said, "He says, hey, I'm He says, "Well, what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I'm the vice provost for student affairs." He says, "So what is that?" And I describe my job, and he looks at me and says, "Man, it must suck to be you." <laughs> But how does that show up in the other world? On those days when we say, I've got these really tough decisions, I've got these some really difficult conversations. So how do I transform that and say, boy, think about the gift of leadership that I've been handed to me today. Think about the incredible opportunity that I have to transform what we're faced with here today. So think about sort of the, 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 the weight of your heart and, and, and what that means. The breadth of your heart so think about what is the range of your humanity. Think about who you're capable of wrapping your arms around and holding in relationship with you at this time. So who are the range, what's the range of people with whom you're capable of being in, in community? Who have you and can you create space for in your life and in your world? And then what is the composition of your circle? You know, when I went to Heidelberg, um, it was Heidelberg College at the time, um, from, from, from Akron, my capability was very, very narrow. I went there with a, with a, with a huge chip on my shoulder, not realizing it was there. Just because of the conditions under which I had, I had grown up. I was first in my family to go to, to, go to college. I mean, I'm, I'm one of eight children. The only one to, I have a brother who went to college but didn't graduate. Um, and so I went there, and we had gone to all black schools, inner city schools, and for the first time in this environment where I'm a minority and trying to figure out what that meant. And so, you know, the range of people with whom I was capable of being in a relationship was, was very, very narrow. And they showed up. They showed up in my incapacity to engage in a thoughtful and caring way with people who are different from me. Now that's the magic of education, though, right? <laughs> the transformative power of education. When I was, um, you know, Scott mentioned that I served as interim dean of, of, of liberal arts, and uh, when I first met the first meeting with the liberal arts um, faculty, first question the faculty asked me: So, talk talk about what your experience is with the liberal arts, and I, I really just. First feeling we had was the liberal arts saved my life. The education, the relationships that we have can be life saving for people. And think about the, the number of people who you can put in and what you can do in terms of, of empowering and, and resuscitating people who's, who, are, who are disillusioned and people who are, um, who are concerned and frustrated, and we can be life-giving in terms of that. 
And one of the things I would say to my son sometimes in terms of the, the circle is that he would roll his eyes, um, is that your circle should reflect your desires. So each of us should ask, what are my desires for the world? And what does my circle say about my ability to live my desires? I know that I want to live in sort of a, an inclusive, caring world. So I have to look around and say, does my circle reflect that I live an inclusive life? That's a challenge for leaders, because again, people look at us to say, who gets access to them? Who gets access to relationship with them? And finally, the, the depth of your heart. How far are you able to invite others into your, uh, into your life and your experiences? How deeply are you able to explore the experiences of, the experiences of others? You know, people, when they come to us in our organizations, want us to be on their side. And, and being a vice president of student affairs, I knew that no matter what student came to me, their expectation was that I was on their side. So it didn't matter what my personal politics were, it didn't matter what my faith orientation was, it didn't matter what my, my belief system was. My responsibility from their perspective was to have space for their story in my life and to respond in a way that demonstrated that I cared about that story. Most difficult, one of the most difficult conversations in my professional career is when a student came to me because she was going to go through sex reassignment surgery and asked if I would be her ally. And this was like 1997. And there was nothing in my life or my professional experiences that prepared me for that conversation. And my inside, when she started, I said, well, I would love to do that, but help me to understand what that means. And then she started to describe the process. And inside, I'm saying, too much information. But I knew enough about my experience with students was that they only tell you the story if they believe that it's important for you to know in order for you to support them. And so all of a sudden, I had to create a space in my life for a story, a conversation, that my life was not designed to accommodate. But that's what members of our organizations expect of us, to find space for their stories in ways that we honor them and that we show that we cherish them, as hard as it may be to hear and as much as it may be against what we consider to be our own value system. I, um, before I came to OSU, I worked for seven years as the Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at a small Catholic college in Rochester, New York. Um, and I'm not Catholic. And so I had, my responsibility was to support the institution's mission and their value statement, which was teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. And I had many conversations with the president about how I disagree with the Pope. <laughs> and his <laughs> response was, we didn't hire you for your personal opinion. He said in the most kind and thoughtful way that you could say, but I got the point. That what they hired me to do was to support the mission of the institution not to enact my personal values for my position which means I needed to create space in my life for perspectives that were different than my own and support a world and a community that may function in a way that's different than I, that would, than I would design it to function. So that was the challenge and so the, the depth. And so the question is, so whose story can you be? I mean, who gets access to your story? And we know that our stories are, are differentially known um, within our organization. Because uneven is who knows us and who doesn't know us. And in the minds of people in our organization, that it creates what they think is a hierarchy of relationships and a hierarchy of, of connection. And so the question I would ask is then, so who shows up when you're called one of these? Who does your organization get? And is it different who they get during times of controversy and when who they get 
during times of, of success. I used to tell a story about one of our former presidents who I, just, who I love deeply, um, Paul Risser, um, who had this sort of very even demeanor. <laughs> and I would tell people, you back and go to him, and I would say, um, well, Paul, we just had you know, a student get busted you know, for, for drugs on campus. There's this distribution ring going on in the residence hall. And, you know, so there's an interagency group just came in and busted us. And you say, so what are we going to do? Or you can go to him and say, you know, Paul, oh, I heard he's got a $180 grant. He said, that's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like, at least my interaction with it, it was always the same. You knew what you were going to get. Right? And so I would know who he would show up as, as a leader with that. But there's sometimes that we, it's sort of like you take somebody bad news and if you get somebody who just blows up. And then other times you get somebody who's, I don't know. So who are they going to get? And so oftentimes when we think about it, when people ask sort of who, you, who are you, first thing we think of is our greatest hits. Right? I'm thoughtful, I'm caring, and so we think of ourselves at our best. When you ask people in the organization who is a leader, they don't give you their greatest hits. They say, well, depends on what day you're talking about. Well, sometimes they can do this, or sometimes they can do that. So they give you the unevenness. Right? And so the challenge, I think, as a leader is to have people be able to answer the question, so who shows up? when this person is part of one to be. And to think about what you want that response to be relative to you. Because that is the legacy response. That's the response of, here's who this person was in the life of our organization. And here's who I come to rely upon and come to this person to be. And hopefully we're all concerned about, about legacy um, in some way. And then, the other question is sort of, to what foundation is your leadership anchored? We all have to be anchored somewhere in the world. Some people are anchored in hope. Some people are anchored in fear. Some people are anchored in optimism. Some people are actually anchored in anger about the condition of things. So what is your, what is your anchor? And you have to think about, when you think about where you're anchored, can you be anchored to more than one thing at the same time? I don't quite know the answer to that, but sometimes you might say, well, I think I'm anchored on, you name lots of different things, but that means your, your foundation is pretty, pretty spread out, as opposed to being able to go deep in what you're anchored in. And so, again, gives you some other things later that may, that may ask you to think about that a little bit more. <coughs> and so, I want to just spend a little bit of time, as I finish up and I get to the end, I'm talking about leadership responsibilities. And what I mean are the primary roles um, that we have as leaders. So the first thing I think is the responsibility we have to navigate our organizations and communities through the right conversations. We spent a lot of time in conversation in our organizations. But the unfortunate thing is that oftentimes we spend a lot of time in the wrong conversations. You know, and in my view, conversations, particularly successful conversations, are about people who care talking about things that matter. And so how do we get people in the right conversations about the right thing? And the challenge that we have as leaders is that oftentimes people will bring what they think is a conversation to us. And the question is, do we honor that as the real conversation, or do we reconstruct, <laughs> reframe it into the conversation that's no seeds to be had? Or the, at least the conversation which we're willing to engage. I um, think all we've had a lot of, sort of difficult and challenges on our campus. And, and one of the common responses is to hold community forums and rallies um, to address things. And so a common one is to 
for students they want to have stop the hate rally. And uh, in the last couple of years of my job, I got invited by students. The student called me at my desk and asked if I would be willing to come to a stop the hate rally and speak on behalf of the administration. And I chose my words very carefully and I said, sorry, I'm not available to represent um, administration that night. Um, but I went to the rally. And they had an open mic, and so there was a line that you could stand in um, for, um, to make comments. And so when I got to the, to the front, I, you know, I thanked the, the organizers and um, commented that I had been invited to come and speak on behalf of, of administration um, and that I had declined um, because I didn't want to speak about the pain and the hurt that the community was experiencing as an administrator. I wanted to speak about it as someone who lived in the community. And then the, the real challenging part was I wanted to honor what they were trying to do, but I wanted to also reframe it. And I said, you know, I appreciate the desire of the organizers to live in a hate-free world. But people who are the object of hate want something more than not to be hated. They want to be loved. They want to be cared about. They want to be nurtured. And so what would it mean if we were to have a conversation about how to create a more loving community? We take care of the hate then, but then we know what's going to be in this place when we get rid of it. And so that challenge of how do we get our organizations into the right conversations, and particularly conversations that would be good for our souls and good for our spirit. I know anti-hate conversations drain my energy. They get old really fast. But conversations about creating a loving, beloved community, energy inspiring. And so how do, we, how do we get there? We have a responsibility to demonstrate generosity. You know, we are confronted with people sometimes. We work with folks who are not always the most pleasant to be around. And how do we continue to work with them and to be very be generous toward them? And again, one of my challenges one of my issues when I went to school was the absence of generosity. And it really was interesting for me because I thought that it was about race. And eventually what I found out when I went to school was about class. It was about being poor and going to the small private school and being around people who had money for the first time. And it really played out in a relationship with one 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 that fell on my floor. Um, this guy by the name of Robert, he insisted people call him Robert. And so I started college in 1971, and so he was being really formal, and it's like, this is not the age for that. But he insisted he wore a, he wore a tweed jacket, you know, with the patches on the sleeve, and had a pipe. <laughs> no, no, nothing in it, just a pipe. It was, it, was just, it was just for effect. And he insisted that people call him Robert, and people wanted to call him Bob, and he was like, no, Robert, Robert, Robert. And so, um, he would, every morning, morning bird, you know, morning bubble. <laughs> and finally, he stopped me one day. He says, why can't you call me Robert? And I said, you try to get some eyes. I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. And, you know, my mother would say to me all the time, one of the things is that you never call somebody out of their name. And, it really started to bother me that I had really disregarded what I, as what I saw as the core value that I come from mother about respect for others. And so I went back and I apologized. I said, I'm sorry. It's my deal. And when I thought about it, what it was is that when he said, good morning, Larry, what I heard was, I've got money and you don't. It was, I had no place for generosity. I couldn't take what he said as a sincere wish of me having a good morning. 
it's not easy to confront yourself on this kind of stuff. And it was painful for me to make sense out of what I had come to believe about the world. Because again, and, when I, and it wasn't anything that anybody ever told me. But my mother and my grandmother cleaned houses for me. And they would come home and I would hear them share the stories of this treatment in the homes that they worked in. And what I'd come to believe was that people who had money didn't have souls because they mistreated the people who I most cherished in the world. So I had to overcome my own stuff in order to ever be able to be in a position to work with students from backgrounds different than my own. Not easy. But that was a requirement, ultimately becomes a requirement of leadership that you sort of have to ask that question, what is my capacity to be generous? And what gener and who are those for whom I find myself just not being able to have the generosity? And we would know. You can know the people who start to talk and you begin to tune them up. You move on to the next thing because you just don't have the patience or the space for their story. Our organization members expect generosity from us. They expect us to see the best of their intentions. We've got a responsibility to be accessible and sit in the middle. And sitting in the middle is not about being neutral. In organizations that sometimes become polarized around issues, the question is, who stands in the middle and holds up our mission that says, however we resolve this, we will come out of it being who we say we are. And that challenge of, of, of mediating those, those poles, um, which again we see so often um, on, on the university campus, require that someone is going to be mission-centered in their leadership. And that there's somebody who's accessible to all members of the organization or to the community. And people, again, people come to you wanting you to not just be on their side, but to choose their side <coughs> for the one that you're going to align with. And I mean, there's nothing more destructive to the credibility of a leader than to keep switching sides. The choosing sides on choosing sides on issues. Because you make somebody else, somebody is always going to be the outsider. And someone's always going to be distant from us. And so as a leader, we have to figure out how can I be equally accessible to all parties in challenging, in challenging issues. And the way we do that is to elevate our mission. I think as leaders, think about what it means to lead people and to manage things. People don't want to be managed. We manage our time, we manage our budgets, we manage the organization and resources. But when I ever felt like, when I got to a place where I felt like I, I was compelled to manage a person, there was either something wrong, seriously wrong with them or seriously wrong with me. And I think what people want more than anything is to be led, to be inspired, to be challenged, to be supported. All those things that go with being a responsible and a, and a caring leader. But we've got to make sure that we, we, we don't put ourselves in a position of, of managing, managing individuals, because management is very close to manipulation. And again, I think nobody, I can, at least I don't want to be managed. There are other people who do, people who really want to be managed. But I always found it quite offensive when I felt like somebody was managing, managing me. Um, to be a limited, uh, be creative, not a limited in our leadership. Again, I think oftentimes in our organizations, we sometimes are confronted with problems. And again, the challenge we're faced is, am I trying to eliminate a problem or am I trying to create a future? And there's a, and there, and there, there's a real strong dichotomy between those two. Um, and there's a difference in the kind of energy that we use for each. And so the difference, at least in my behavior, when I'm putting my garden in, <laughs> and when I start to clean out the last of the pumpkins that are there, it's a very different behavior. One has to be, is, is thoughtful, is caring about what's going to come next. The other is, I'm just trying to get rid of the, the mess. 
And so part of our challenge is to think about how do we put our organization in a position where they're considering the best possibilities, which is the creative element of our leadership, that we're doing more than just eliminating. And even when we were trying to go through budget reduction exercises, it wasn't about eliminating. It was about, still about creating a future. Because again, it was show people in our organization, my job was not to manage the client. I don't have any skills at it. <laughs> I was not trained at managing the client. <laughs> and so how do we create a situation where as an organization we're managing we're forecasting and managing toward our growth? To lead on um, the development of an ethical landscape. And oftentimes the ethics of an organization are based upon two things, an ethic of care and an ethic of membership. Ethic of care is that Everyone in an organization deserves and receives care. And the other is that regardless of role, everybody has full membership in that organization. And though we have hierarchical structure, <coughs> membership status is not differentiated. Everyone is fully human. Everyone is receives all the dignity that they deserve and to which they're entitled. And so as leaders, how we treat people helps to establish that ethical landscape um, within the organization. Leaders, we have responsibility to reside in hope and to communicate a hopeful image of the future. I would often share with folks in our organization that I would be the last person in our organization to be discouraged. Because I have this belief that you never need people to a condition that you can't need them out of. And so if I show up disillusioned and I communicate a perspective of disillusionment, there are people in the organization who will seize that. <coughs> who will latch on to it. Again, I just think about, again, relate that to having a teenager where, you know, they tell you something and now you start to write words and words and words and words. Then the next day you ask them about it and you're like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, well, how come I'm worrying and you stop caring about it? Well, sometimes people can give you a condition and you all of a sudden go there emotionally and suddenly you get pulled into it, you latch on to it, and then they move on. Well, what happens, though, unfortunately, is that if you get disillusioned one day and then you come back hopeful, there are people who won't let the disillusionment go because it served a purpose and it's going to serve a purpose for them. And so how do you make sure that you only need people into the conditions that you want them to occupy and to reside in? And I would love to create an organization where you couldn't get people out of the perspective of being hopeful. Where people are are fatally hopeful <laughs> that yeah I believe in the future and I am optimistic about what will happen regardless of the conditions with which we're we're confronted and so leading toward hope is a really a very important responsibility as leaders we need to embody grace which is to be graceful gracious and grateful. You know, I would share with people sometimes that I would leave some of our senior leadership meetings or other organization meetings with my heart broken by decisions that we would make. And I would just wonder how do we get to the place that that's the outcome that we decided. But I would always make sure that the responsibility is here's what we decided. <laughs> because even when things don't go your way, how do you continue to be gracious? in response to that. And how do you continue to be grateful for the opportunities that you've had? I've had some, some bad jobs in my career. Um, and even when leaving, I felt like I tried really hard to be grateful that they took the risk to hire me, even for a bad job. That there's grace that's required, as opposed to the kind of ways that sometimes we want to exit an organization. Well, again, I think there, there, there is an ethic to how we exit 
organizations, and there's an ethic to how we handle our disappointment within organizations. And I think as leaders, if we can be characterized by that quality of grace, it communicates to others um, the expectation for how they should be when they go through the, the ups and downs of the organization. Just a couple more. To elevate the sacred in our work. Leadership is an absolutely sacred role. When you think about what it means to be entrusted with the welfare, the emotional condition, the career prospects, in some cases, even the compensation level of others, that is an incredibly sacred responsibility. You know, when I would, uh, after that, you know, it, it must suck to be you episode, I, I really started to think more about how I would describe to students what my job was. And the shorthand that I came up with was that my job is to leave in other people's children. Even when they don't believe in themselves. And it is a sacred role to be an educator to have this ability to influence the emotional and the psychic condition of another person. And to help them to, to, to see things in themselves they may not see. I had a student um, in the class that I'm teaching this, this fall came to meet with me on um, Friday morning and sort of said that she was really afraid to speak in class. And that, you know, I've asked questions that she really wants to respond to and she is just afraid doesn't know how to do it. And so, could I talk with her? And so then her very final request at the end is that, can we meet every Friday morning just so that you can help me do that? Well, the vulnerability that it took for her to come, because she just got through the class without saying anything. But you know, after two sessions, the vulnerability to come and say, can you help me to find my voice? That's a sacred responsibility that we have. And that's what people in the organizations are asking leaders. Can you find, help me to find my voice? Can you help me to find my unique leadership path? And so elevating this, the sacred in our work, which in the end of the day is the sacredness of service to our mission. You know, and I, I was remiss in saying at the beginning, one of the things that I've gotten from Scott um, and why well, in many ways he should be standing here talking to you about leadership is the way he has helped our university to reframe the conversation about engagement and outreach and what global leadership was. Absolutely has changed it and has elevated the sacredness of that mission within our university. And that's a role that we can play. And I want to thank you for, for bringing that to our university. And the final one is to sustain the connection between what's in our head and what's in our hearts. Technical knowledge is absolutely essential. We've got to know our work. We've got to have knowledge. But we also have to have our hearts engaged as we do that, as we do our work. So I want to finish with a, a, a story. Um, Again, it involved, it involved my son. We were, um, when he was younger, we were in San Francisco for a, a bowl game to see Oregon State play at um, Alma Mater University of Maryland. And we were walking down around Fisherman's Wharf, my, um, my son, my spouse, and I. And, and my wife said, I think that's Santana. Um, and my son was a big music fan and said, Wow, oh, Carlos Santana. And so, um, we sort of hung around outside the, the gallery that he went into, not stalking. <laughs> Again, I, I know the legal definition. <laughs> um, so we stood around anyway, outside, we stood outside waiting for him to come out. And so finally, and I'm, a, I'm an introvert, so I was, I was not doing any talking. You know, I'm just standing there talking. But my wife, she's, uh, she's famous. So, um, so, so he, he, he comes out and he's with, he's, he's with his wife and you know, they're walking their hand in hand and he's dressed impeccably, all white, you know, hat, 
and we didn't just be living like a rock star. <laughs> and uh, so my wife goes to him and she says, um, Mr. Santana, um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, she wasn't. <laughs> said, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, um, but you know, our son um, plays the guitar and he really loves your music. And um, our son was really short at the time, and, and so Santana goes over to him and gets down on one knee. He says, so you play the guitar, huh? He said, yeah. He said, so other than my music, who do you like? And somebody said, I'm like, you know, John Lee Hooker and Gail Moe. Somebody was playing blues stuff at the time. He was like six years old. Um, <laughs> and so Santana says, would you mind if I give you a gift? And he says, he says, okay, he says, I want you to close your eyes. And he says, give me your hands. And so he took my son's hands like this, and he put his hands over them. And he says, now close your eyes. He says, now I'm going to draw a string from here to here. He says, now move your head up and down. Can you feel the string pulling in your heart? He says, yeah. He says, the world needs our music now more than ever. He said, when you play your music, make sure you keep this connected to this. And when I look at the condition of our world, I think that applies to anybody who's in a leadership role. The world needs our leadership now. Our organizations need our leadership now more than ever. But as we do it, let's make sure that our heads and our hearts stay connected. Thank you very much.